from a closet, also known as the Jim McCarthy VoiceOvers World Headquarters Studio. This is the JMVO Weekly Primer. Please subscribe, rate, and comment via JimMcCarthyVoiceOvers.com forward slash podcast. This is the ninth episode of the JMVO Weekly Primer, the podcast that you ought to be listening to at the beginning of every week to get your mind munching on some sort of wisdom nugget and marinating your mind in good stuff. That's why we're here, is to really get you thinking for the week. And hi, my esteemed guest for this episode is none other than Ar- Arnie Malham. Malham. Hope I'm, I'm, we went over this before, and I hope I'm saying it right. <laughs> he has been um, one of the most foremost and preeminent Nashville entrepreneurs for the past uh, just under 30 years. Uh, started a business called CJ Advertising. But prior to that, and we'll get into all this stuff and everything, um, was a, an account executive for television and just kind of started your career coming out of college in 8990 figuring out, you, you really started getting into the entrepreneurial space within that five-year space. So I'd imagine it's something that was ingrained in you from early on. Um, but basically took the bull by the horns in the early 90s, built up a business that had a uh, tremendous influence for a lot of entrepreneurs that I know. And you've really become quite a, uh, an influencer here in Nashville and certainly within the region. Welcome to my podcast, Mr. Arnie Malham. How are you? Huge. Uh, that was a huge words. I, I deserve about a quarter of them. I appreciate it though. Uh, we've, we've survived. And I yeah. think that's, that's big in business. Sometimes you just survive business. You keep moving forward. Uh, as we like to say, and by the, the shirt I'm wearing, we like getting it wrong on the way to getting it right. And we've certainly got it wrong a lot. I've, I've, I've just kept forging ahead, kept forging yeah, ahead. That's all you really can do. You just, you know, you only fail if you quit. <laughs> that's right. That's right. But you're right about the, you know, the entrepreneurship. My dad ran a small business in Arkansas and, and, and he, what we'd call him is the e-myth entrepreneur. He, he was a sort of attached to a business that had his name on it, but did it really run like a business or did it run uh, as sort of a, a, his, his own the thing he had to be involved with, right? He was sort of practicing the e-myth in that sense. And so the real goal was to create a business that, that, that goes beyond the, the head of the company, right? And that's right. hopefully, you know, I think the ultimate compliment is when you sell a business, that's, that's, I think, the ultimate compliment because you've created value and then someone else is able to take that value and build upon it. And I think that's what I'm, I'm most excited about at this stage of my life is, is where the companies that I've built are going as opposed to where they've been. Now, what I'm intrigued by is that over that time at CJ Advertising and the other offshoots that you've created within that business, you've created, and I'm big on this, I I believe that culture eats strategy for breakfast. It's something that Ivan Meisner touts. It's uh, big in B&I. Building that culture to get everybody rowing in the same direction, that in and of itself is probably 85% of the battle. In a right. And and that's and part of that is discovering that you're responsible for that culture, right? That, that for a long time in business, I thought, well, if I had better people, I'd have a better culture. I thought, oh, once I create some success, I'll have time for culture. Once once uh, we make money, then we'll have culture. But it's the opposite in all of those situations. That the culture comes from the leader. It it starts and ends there. Uh, it must come first for anything sustainable uh, for any period of time. And that if you're not working on your culture. Then, then you're eventually going to fail. That, that, that every new ideas are a dime a dozen. Execution only lasts as long as the team is working together, but, but culture will sustain. It took me 15 years to figure that out. But once we did, everything we were doing got better. So 15 years, did it go by in the blink of an eye? <laughs> yeah. Overnight success story uh, <laughs> where, where, where you know, we, were, we were trying to drive our people. And even the word drive is the, is the first clue that we were doing it wrong. Like it was about how hard, how tight could we hang on? How hard we, could we make them work? You know, how much could we squeeze out of the opportunity as opposed to trusting our people to get it, to get it right, uh, to find their own path, uh, to do it the way they knew it had to be done. Uh, and that's really the turn. And so it's it made a huge difference in our business when we when we finally stopped driving our people and started leading our people. And it was right. a, a huge, huge difference in how the agency worked, how our call center worked, uh, how everything we did sort of came to life. Was CJ advertising in the beginning, um, did it specify or did it specialize in uh, personal injury attorney advertising? Yeah. Not not just in the game. It's all we've ever done since 1995 sure. is, is, is very focused 
on driving P- P- or personal injury brands in their respective markets to be the best known and the most liked. And, and so we did that through, through putting uh, lawyers on TV and, and using their personality uh, and their brand to, to mean something to that city. And, and so our, you know, our sort of our pie in the sky goal was to, was to, was to, take after movies like Aaron Brockovich, where people cheer for the lawyer and movies like Rainmaker, you know, the Grisham novel, where you cheer for the lawyer and civil action with John Travolta, where you cheer, like give the people someone they can, they can uh, put their arms around and cheer for and, and put on their side. And that takes a whole mindset towards, towards building a brand that quite frankly, isn't everyone's first, you know, Oh, personal injury lawyers. Oh, that sounds great. It, it only sounds great if you need one. And our job was to, was to set our brands up for success when, folks in that community needed someone to turn to. And it's funny because I, I, it's interesting how that you can compare that to, let's say, the collision business. Uh, they know that they're not exi- – We kn- personal injury attorneys get the fact that we're the last people you want to need. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And it's – exactly. And, and basically, when I worked with your company uh, several years ago doing videos, one of the things that came out was – how just the insurance companies have the PR uh, horsepower to paint these guys into a corner and make them look bad all day long as, you know, until the cows come home. And that was something that was really eye-opening for me. And no one ever talks about that. Yeah, it's, it's, we refer to it as mattresses and tires. Like you never, you never think about mattresses or tires until you need a mattress or tires. And all of a sudden they're on sale and they're everywhere. Uh, but in the meantime, they're in the background, so I'm lay, laying the foundation. And that's what we do. We sort of lay the foundation uh, to be a brand in a market you can trust. We only represent one firm per mm-hmm. market, and our mm-hmm. focus is on that firm. Uh, but then when someone does need a lawyer and, and when the insurance company is not treating them fairly, when, when they're being the big bully that they can be, uh, in many situations, then then a lawyer comes to bear, but but whether we were building brands for lawyers or or creating tires for cars or whatever business we might be in, it was it it had to be about how to get it done in a sustainable and remarkable way. That mm-hmm. that the two things that I found that kill business are turnover uh, and aptitude. And you and, mm-hmm. and if you and if you have high turnover, it's going to be a hard time building up that aptitude and, and vice versa. So it's about, it's about getting people in your shop that want to be there, that look forward to coming to work every day, look forward to the people they're hanging out with, the environment they're in, the goals that they have, the people that they serve, and then we roll from there. Yeah. I mean, that's, it makes a lot of sense. And, I, and I'm sure you run into people all the time that want to scale their business, but do it in spite of themselves and because of not having those culture-building tenets that you enabled over the years. Now, I'm going to ask, in the first 15 years uh, of CJ advertising, did you notice that that was an issue as far as, no. okay, I need to build a culture of this trying yeah, to Yeah, we, we were just burning. We were just burning oil. Like, we were running hot and we were finding success, but we were burning out our people. We were burning out ourselves. We were burning out our clients. Like, we were making them work too hard for it because we didn't, we couldn't, we couldn't, we didn't have sustainable success. We could, we were sort of over firing the engine, if you will. And so it, that, that's what happens to a business it is if your margins aren't right. And if your culture is not right, you can still be successful. It's just, it's like sprinting. You can do it for a hundred yards, you make it do it for 400 yards. You, you make it do it for a mile, but you're not going to, you're not going to sprint for a marathon. Did you have the rubber band effect in the beginning where you had money and then you didn't have money and then you had, (laughs) you know, it just, it it was, I I would say yes, but more on talent. Like we would finally get some talent in the shop and and make some progress and then we'd lose the talent. And that, that was worse than the money. We, we, we would, we could always find, you know, in the ad agency business, there's a little money game that can be played, but, but we would lose the talent. And then the, the, the big bell went off for me, two different ones. One went in a, a team member, uh, that we were, or a potential team member we were trying to recruit, looked at me and said, look, man, I don't want you on my resume. I don't want you on my resume. It's like, <laughs> oh, yeah. but you don't understand. This is my baby, right? Well, it wasn't his because, mm-hmm. because we didn't have the culture, the mindset, the people. We, weren't, we, weren't, we didn't have the vision to look good. And I vowed from that moment, I'm going to make CJ advertising look good on your resume. You have CJ advertising on your resume, you should be able to get a job in, in this town. Anybody that knows this agency knows that we, that we do the right thing. Uh, and so I wanted CJ to look good on your resume. We talked about growing people, like no matter what happens, if you go to work here for a month, we hope that's not the case or for, or for 10 years, leave here an improved person, leave here better, make this a, a launching pad for your career. We'll do everything we can to make you the best you can be. We hope we do that and you stay. 
but, but, but we're going to look good on your resume no matter what. So that's number one. I don't want you on my resume. Number two is a dear uh, friend of mine now uh, who was a speaker that I was listening to at the time named John DeJulius. Mm-hmm. And, and he was doing a, a talk about how uh, uh, important customer service is and how do you get great customer service is you start with your people. And, and, and what do you do with your people? You create a great culture for them to be in. And by the way, culture reflects leadership. It's like, oh, he means me. <laughs> yeah, he means me. Like, like he would say, if you don't have the culture you want, look in the mirror, man. And so that I, I, I R&D rip off and duplicate that all the time with people. If you don't have the culture you want in your business, look right in the mirror because you're responsible for culture and culture reflects leadership. Be a leader. And that's something, you know, especially in my experience that I've um, come across is, uh, you know, I was in the car business for several years and that industry is just compl- replete with non-culture builders. <laughs> you, you, made, you made personal injury lawyers look good in the car business. <laughs> <laughs> We're right around that same area. Too. <laughs> but I mean, basically, um, uh, it, it was just amazing how, guys, if you just can constantly, I mean, the things that were done to pay and it you know, was just completely, Oh yeah, we know you earned that last month and we owe it to you, but now we don't. And you know, stuff like that. Be like, Guys, what, how do you think this helps you? <laughs> yeah. We, 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 we have, you know, we were in a, uh, a call center for about 16 years called legal intake professionals. And, and that's a tough business. We, we sold it last February. It was a big deal. We've sold it to a huge company with huge resources. They're going to take, our $6 million company, and they're going to turn it probably into an $18 million company in like nice. 18 months. I mean, they, they have the, they know what they're doing. They have the resources. We were cobbling it together, but what we did right is that we got our people right. And I would, and, and we would, when, when they came in and their training, we talked to them about the environment that we wanted them to have, that when they arrived for work in their car, I wanted them excited about coming in and the people they'd see and, and the, the fact that the, uh, the, the, this place was better than home, like leave crazy at home. This is going to be a place where you can predict what's going to happen. You're going to trust the people around you. The bathrooms are going to be clean and you're going to enjoy being here. That's the culture that helps turnover stay down. Uh, as opposed to, as opposed to, I, 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 I just hate that I have to go to work today. Right. Yeah. And I think some, all of us at one point in our lives have been there. I know a- I have. Abs- absolutely. Right. Yeah. It's not going to be a good day and, there's, and, and work makes it worse. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, have you heard uh, of, a, of a man named Matt Monero? He actually came out with a book lately called uh, You Need More Money. I, I know. That sounds interesting, though. Okay. Tell me he more. Actually, he talked about he grew a business, and your, your stories are similar because the timelines are the same. He took a business. He, it's all commercial fleet financing, so big, heavy equipment financing uh, fleet deals is what he basically got into when he was 25. You know, at that age, he had no business doing it. He has figured it out, uh, built the business. And, and it's funny because it's like you guys should really connect because the, the stories are so parallel. Um, he, he at one point torched part of his business, even letting go a salesperson who brought in, you know, who was making his part of it was, you know, half a million dollars a year. So you can only imagine what he was bringing into the business um, because the guy, you know, he just needed to make cultural tweaks, uh, put new paint on the walls, get new chairs, adopt a, you know, why are we doing this? You know, Simon Sinek start with why kind of attitude. Yeah. He says he took that and went from, I think it, it, he built it to 30, $32 million a year business. And in 18 months, it went from $32 million to $100 million after he made those tweaks. Just amazing. And he calls that, it torching his business. Yeah. I, I, I would tell you the, the name of the book again. Uh, you Need More Money. You Need More Money. It's very simple. <laughs> Even his podcast is called You Need More Money. Yeah. But definitely a guy to reach out to. He's out of Dallas. And I think you guys really would have quite the parallel story to tell. Yeah. Because I mean, it sounds, like, it sounds like you did that at one point after 15 years. You just, okay, this is, this is me. I got to establish a culture and a why as to why they're coming in. It, yeah. And it, and it, you know, I, I don't have that cliff story where it was one thing and it became another. It was, it was, I realized it. And then over time, you know, we started to make people, people, we give tours now of our, of our facility because, because we put a lot of our culture on the walls and we, and we measure and explain it. And people say, how did you, how did you get from, from not having a culture to this culture? And my response is, is gradually. And then all of a sudden, like, yeah. it's not, there's no cliff. It's that you do one thing, you get it, you get it consistent. You do another thing, you get it consistent. You know, all of a sudden you got six programs going on simultaneously run by six different people in the organization. And it's sustainable as opposed to the, I came from a conference. I saw this, we're going to do this for 90 days and then, and then we forget about it. Right. 
it takes daily practice. You got to train yeah. at it. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so you also, during that time, got into the entrepreneur organization. You want to talk a little bit about that? Well, EO uh, you know, is a global organization uh, that that also has a chapter here in Nashville. We have actually the one of the world's top largest chapters by chance. Nashville's on fire. There's no secret to that. Mm -hmm. But being around folks who are who are also making mistakes, but, but growing their business every day uh, has been a huge difference maker for me um, to, to be able to, to have a group, you know, your family doesn't want to hear about crazy times at work. You, you, your team wants to, wants to advance, but sometimes the struggles, they don't, they don't quite see the same way. And EO is a group of entrepreneurs that can get together and share experiences, never advice. And then and, and it helps us learn from each other, helps us stay on that path uh, uh, that it that takes so long to build a great business and, and do it together. Joe Friedman uh, got me in and and has gotten a lot of folks into EO in terms of he knew it was a great place, uh, has recruited a lot of folks in. And now my, I've, I'd, I'd say most of my best friends are part of the organization because because we share so many common experiences. Right on, right on. So at one point, you started putting and marinating your mind in good stuff. And this is the basis of this podcast. And you started doing... And I was reading your story in the NBJ that you started doing uh, the personal library of books that you would read. You started building that at work right. and encouraged your employees to start reading the same books that you were reading. Like, oh my gosh, open yourself up to the amazing knowledge that's free right here in the ongoing education. And that essentially became into what you're doing now. When our, or it started with your book and then into the Better Book Club, correct? Yeah. Yeah, the, the, you know, the concept is if, if why don't you, you know, the, the, the angry entrepreneur, like I like to talk about him a lot because he, he, he's common and he says, why don't my people think like me? Why don't they think like me? And, it, and it's because they're not getting the same stuff in their brains, right? They're not reading the same books, not going to the same conferences, they're not hanging out with the same people. And so what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do to help your people think more like you? And so the real simple thing is how about, what if they read some of the same things you read? And there's a couple ways to go about that. One is tell them what to read. And, you know, your kids nor your team members typically like to be told what to do. Mm -hmm. And so that, that typically backfires. And so how about just give them resources from which they can choose? And so one of the, one of the concepts is that, is, is that, that we started promoting was this huge library of books where I said, look, I don't care what you read. In fact, it, it didn't have to be in this library. If you read something that improves you in any way, I'll pay you to read it. And, and it was, I was that desperate and that crazy in terms of creating some sort of system. And, and that became the Better Book Club. And so we, it's our little headline. We pay people to read. We, in, in our organization, you can make up to 100 bucks a quarter just by reading books. But over time, it's, a, it's the best investment of training we ever did. I've got team members right out of college and those with a ton of experience now reading books that give them better ideas and our company better ideas. And the concept has grown and grown and grown. So it really just started with that seedling and then you incentivized it and then it took off. It, it is, it is, it has changed. I believe changed the course of many people's careers as they start to discover uh, some of the secrets to business that, that just aren't taught in school anywhere. Yeah. And it's, you're absolutely right. And a lot of the influencers out there, Vaynerchuk talks about that all the time, uh, about how schools are kind of failing people when it comes to up-to-date information on that kind of stuff. Um, that's certainly my story. When I got out of the last organization where I was working for somebody else, it ended, I came home and I told my wife, I'm done working for somebody else and we're going to do this and I have enough equity and horsepower to do it. Yeah. Um, but from that day on, I, I, I stopped listening to the news, um, even music. I just started marinating my mind in good podcasts, uh, audio books, all that stuff. Every, yeah. to this day, I, I continue to do it. <clears throat> it's very important. The, the, once the mind goes in motion, it's hard, it's hard to stop it. Yeah. When you populate it with good yeah. stuff, amazingly, good things start to happen. Um, so talk about at what point did you realize that this now would become a business and you're transitioning, you built up CJ. And as you said before, uh, the value in it and the big, biggest compliment is when somebody else sees the value and says, oh my gosh, I could do, I could take yeah. this to, to loftier heights now. Right, right. Um, so you're, you're out of CJ, correct? 
That's right. We uh, the transaction. I'm I'm in a transitionary role as of today, but within a few months, uh, there'll be a new CEO, mm-hmm. uh, and I will step down. But the 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 concept was that I would I would I was fortunate enough that to to go speak about culture in a few venues uh, as a as a speaker on a circuit a little bit, and when I did people would latch onto this idea about paying people to read. And they always want to tell me their book club story, but, and they always want to tell me how can they implement the same plan for reading books that I did. And, and, and ours was kind of sort of a cobbled together. It wasn't really something I could export. And so one day we just said, Hey, let's build it. And so we built a software, betterbookclub.com, betterbookclub.com to help companies basically implement the same platform in their business that we'd implemented here. And it caught on. People started using it. I've got I've, uh, users, engaged users of Better Book Club across the globe. We Companies in Australia, the UK, uh, Canada, uh, on almost every state in the US, there are companies using Better Book Club to help grow their people, which is pretty cool. And then once, once we got that little, you know, we got that little, that little kindling started, it started, it started building from there. And so now, I've, uh, when, as we turn, I turn my attention away from, from CJ and onto Better Book Club, our goal is to build better book club into something that can take off. Um, and I don't know that I'm the person to build it from here to infinity, but I'm, I feel very confident I'm the person to get it from here to at least a fire worth raging. And that's kind mm-hmm. of our goal. Right on, right on. And then the worth doing wrong book, how did that, was that kind did that birth the concept of the better book club? No, the, it, the book, uh, you know, here's, hey, look, a little self-promotion. There you go. Better book club. It was <laughs> worth doing wrong. Uh, the, uh, everything I know about culture is in this little 160-page book, and it's big type and lots of pictures, so it ain't much. But uh, this, you know, it's a chapter in here about how to make Better Book Club work for you in your organization. But there's also a chapter about reward, about recognition in your company. There's a, there's a chapter about core values. There's a, there's a chapter about um, uh, naming your culture and, and, and how – a culture with a name and a mascot can grow beyond uh, the limits uh, and, and other things that we did in CJ to create a tourable culture. Like, the, like I, we do about three, four tours a month of people that come from a long ways and say, show me what you've done. Uh, show, tell me about your morale survey. Tell me about better book club. Tell me about your reward system. Tell me about you know, your recognition, your profit sharing. Tell me about these things. And, and so, and so everything we did is in the book. Uh, which means that we can pass it on and help others grow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, and I, I'm a huge, I know a lot of guys who have built businesses over several years who you kind of beat them to the punch. I told them, I said, you need to write a book about culture building and start speaking on it. So is that another tangent that you're looking into is doing speaking engagements and things of that nature? I'll, I'll do uh, about eight to 12 speaking engagements a year, Some, right sometimes in a really big crowd, sometimes they're a really small crowd. Uh, but it's, it's always just to pass on, really just help them R&D what I have R&D'd, ripped off and duplicated, uh, and so that they can use it in their business. But so the you're, only, you're yeah. exchanging that information in a way every time you speak? Every time. Like here, right. here, take these. Don't do it all. Don't take everything I'm saying because you'll fail. But go take one thing that you can implement in your company and then come back for more. And we, that's, that's, the, the business is not selling culture. Uh, the only business that I'll be pushing forward is Better Book Club just because I know how well it's going to work for companies. Well, the funny thing is, um, what were some of the most impactful things ever said to you? If there's one in your mind that comes to mind, what was it from well, an employee or a client or whoever? Well, I've already mentioned a couple of them, you know, the, the, the employee or the, the team, potential team member saying, I don't want you on my resume. Mm-hmm. Uh, John DeGilius telling me that culture reflects leadership. Those, those were huge. Uh, I've had, I've had <laughs> tremendous influencers on uh, my business, Jack Daly, I heard him speak back in like 2000, it would be 2007 or something in Vegas. And, and he talked about how when you walk into a business, you can smell the culture. And he didn't mean actually smell, but he meant feel the culture. Like what kind of business is this? And so I've always, it's always stayed with me. So when you walk in our business, you start to feel the culture from the minute you walk in because, because of how we, how we purposely uh, create a, a lobby experience for vendors and potential team members and potential clients. Uh, so that's that's a big one. Uh, Cameron Harold uh, does a great job of getting you fired up about business and 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 talk about a vivid vision uh, and creating a vision for your future and how that can uh, uh, grow yourself and other people around you. And so the influence has come from so many places and so many books and so many authors. But what you said is true. You've got to marinate your mind in it, or it's just blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. 
And I think that um, uh, with with any any positive things that have like after you implemented everything, was there an employee that came out of the woodwork and just said, "Man, you know, just dropped a bomb on you"? That I was like, "Man, that's this is what I was lurk- looking to do. This is what I was working for." Anything like that stand out for you? Well, team team members <laughs> always surprise you sometimes in a good way, and sometimes sometimes they they challenge you a little bit. I uh, the um. I think the biggest uh, thing that I'll, I would say is that uh, when the first 10 books that any team member reads is usually the most impactful, like the ones that really sort of set your mind in motion and realize you got a chance. Now, getting to 10 is a challenge for some, but, but the first 10 start to make an influence on you like none others. Like one, one, of, the, one of the books I read really early was called Goal, and it's just a real simple, a thick but simple book about getting things done and creating goals for yourself. And I remember the, the context of that in a way that's different than the last two or three books I read because they hit me when my brain was just really, really ready to learn. And so those first few books, the advancement of those first few people, again, whether they grow and stay or grow and leave, we one of our big core values is growth and getting people from, from, from where they are to where closer to where they can be. Well, it's funny that brings to mind a question um, and it harkens back to a situation I was in in the car business where the general manager of the dealership, uh, he and I were talking and I said, one of my goals this year is to try and read at least 20 books. And he's like, oh my gosh, I hate reading. I never read. And I'm going, that's okay. That explains a few things. Um, What is some of the biggest resistance or the top three resisting factors that you get from employees? What are the reasons why they don't want to begin that just reading? Well, you know, some sometimes we have a, uh, and, and clients have expressed this that that if they read uh, something new, it may reset how they they like how they think. They're comfortable in the world they live in, and so reading can get you out of your comfort zone a little bit and help and help expose you to ideas you haven't thought of. And so, if you think you know it all, if you think you've got it figured out, then reading might disrupt that. And I and I've had team members say, "Hey, I don't know that I want to put new things in my mind right now, right?" And I, and, and so. That 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 tells me some things. That, you know, that, that, that what what is is that a team member that really fits in a company where one of the core values is growth, right? Mm-hmm. And so so having programs. And by the way, the programs I have are unique to us. And I and I tell people all the time, they need, you need to have programs unique to you that match your core values. But it they need to attract or repel. They, 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 if they, if they're just blah, if they don't matter, then you don't really have a sustainable culture. But if they attract people, if more people like reading than don't, if they repel the people that think reading's for nerds, then you're doing your job. Like I tell, if they're, if I'm not, if my people aren't making fun of me, I'm not doing my job. It's part of the, it's part of the being, being a leader is repeating yourself often, to have some kooky ideas, to try things without a fear of failure, uh, and to, and to make sure you have the right people in the organization that believe what you believe, Mm. especially when they're on the job. That's a huge component, not only with uh, your people as well as clients, you know, because it just makes for such a better working relationship all the way around when you work with people who believe the same way you do. Uh, Certainly, especially with uh, Simon Sinek's uh, TED talk that really skyrocketed him. Talk about making a ton of sense. Um, With the books and everything though, does the book club, <clears throat> tell me, go over just kind of like 50,000 foot, how that works, how the better book club for a business. <clears throat> yeah. So keep, again, it's this, you know, typical business, typical book club is, is the boss says, hey, we're all going to read this book. We, we, he tells 12 people, he buys the book for him and he gives it to him. He says, everybody read this. We're going to talk about it in a month. Well, three people probably do read it because that's, they like, they like to make the boss happy. Uh, about half the team will skim it and then about, you know, another three or four won't read it, but they say they will. And they'll get in a room and they'll talk about that book and then they'll move on to the next book. And look, over nothing, that's pretty good. But we think we have a better way. And our better way is to create a, a very liberally based library. Anything that can grow a person in their, in their personal or business life Put it in your library, recognize and reward the readership, have them get together once a month and talk about the book they read, each one, each one individually, so they can learn not only about the books, but about each other and use all that information to grow your company. And through that reward and recognition, you know, it's, it's crazy that, that you can boil life down to rewards and recognition. The things that we're rewarded and recognized for, we tend to do more of. 
and the things that we're ignored about or punished, we tend to do less of. Now that's, that's, you know, it's, it's like 80, 20, but, but you want your dog to do the right thing, reward and recognize. You want your kids to do the right thing, reward and recognize. You want your team members to do the, the right thing, reward and recognize. What a concept. And, and this is just another thing. If I'm a core believer, if they're growing, uh, the business is growing. And so the book club is just a, a path towards that. Uh, liberal library, read whatever you want, answer a few simple questions about the book, recognize and reward. One of the cool things is that it, I get, as, a, as the entrepreneur, as the business leader, I get an email on every team member's anniversary. It tells me all their reading they've done for the past year, whether it's one book or it's six or 10 books. It gives me a chance to say, hey, Jim, love that you read this. Uh, uh, look forward to seeing what else you learn in the next year. Or, hey, your past reading list looks great. I know you, you're really busy in the last year. I look forward to seeing what happens next year. It gives me a chance to touch base with you on a level of what you've put in your brain. Is it also count for audiobooks? Yeah, any, you, anything. You, you can watch it. You can read it. You can Kindle it. You can listen to it. Uh, any way you absorb the material counts. It's, 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 this isn't about trying to catch you doing something wrong. It's about trying to catch you doing something right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, um, and I'm wondering, maybe this is an age demographic question, uh, with the people who don't want to learn or, or think that they know I'm good. Uh, is there a typical age demographic that that falls in? <laughs> you know, there's, there's not, I mean, all this, I don't even know all the names of the different groups, the millennials, and then there's the generation, whatever Z yeah. and all these things. I, 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 I've not seen that. I've, I've got, uh, folks in every age category that, that, uh, are, that participate in the program. And I've seen people in every category uh, resist the program. So yeah. I think it just comes down to mindset and, 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 you know, who you are as a person. And, and it all comes down to who you want in your company. Do you want folks <laughs> with a growth mindset in your company? And this is just one of the things that help you figure that out. Yeah. I, it's really comes down to when I hear people um, say something along the lines of, well, no, I'm good. You know, I've, I've learned all I need to learn. <clears throat> I've seen that in the car business and various other businesses where you, when you're green, you grow. And when you're ripe, you're rot. And that's, <laughs> it carries a lot of truth in that statement. It's I love it. When you're ripe, you rot. <clears throat> yeah. Not, you when you're, stay green. Yeah. And the, the, one of my, you know, change, we, you, you know, whether, no matter what business you're in or in, change is probably coming. Mm-hmm. Right. And people, oh have people say, Oh, I have a, have a hard time with change and, and I don't know who said it, but you know, if you have a, if you uh, don't like change, you're going to uh, not like um, irrelevance even less. Uh, or the, the only thing that stays the same in life is change. Yeah. And it's, it's, you know, the media world's changing, the government's changing, uh, how, what we write and read on is changing. The fact that we're having this conversation right now uh, via a video conference call, mm-hmm. uh, it, like that's, that didn't exist a few years ago. No. Right. And so, it's uh, everything's coming about. And, and, and I think for the most part, the world's getting better. We're mm-hmm. getting more towards an abundant world, which I believe greatly in and less into a scarcity world where everyone has to say, Oh, this is mine. This is mine. It's a world of abundance. And I think the more we give and share, the more we get in return. And so it's a, it's a, it's, it's going to be a fun time. Getting back to what you said before about uh, putting people in their, in an uncomfortable situation. I think growth happens there. Uh, one of the podcasts on, well, actually one of the podcasts I produced with a friend of mine, we went down to Fort Lauderdale, Miami area. <clears throat> we interviewed Grant Cardone and he said something that was really kind of, made you kind of go, huh? But at the same time you thought about it and went, yeah, it does make sense. But he says, get great at stuff you hate. Because if you get great at stuff you hate, Man, imagine how you're going to get great at stuff you love. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll, you know, it's – you're 100%. Uh, the, the, you know, we, we all – it's we're quick to get in our comfort zones. Uh, and uh, someone said life, you know, life starts outside your comfort zone. And so, you know, it, it means something different to everybody. And we all go through periods where we just – you know, last night, I, I, it's, just, it's just a stupid story, but uh, my wife and I were going to go to the soccer game uh, here in Nashville, but it was 30 mm-hmm. degrees. I, I – that was a little outside my comfort zone. And so, yes, I stayed and watched it at home. A uh, little regret, but I was also warm. So you just, everybody's got to find their place. Yeah. Everybody's got to find their place. Well, Matt Monero, he'll t- put a video up, or at least he did, every morning getting up and taking a swim in a swimming pool when it's like 35 degrees out and the pool water is maybe 55, 60 degrees. And he's like, man, you got to get uncomfortable every day. I'm like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's a whole code – there's a whole co-shower movement I've heard about. A couple of my friends yeah. are practicing it, and it's, they are 
I respect them. They are bold. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I'm you know, glad it works for you, but uh, no thanks. <clears throat> so they may think the same way about, you know, we have, we have team members that may feel the same about, about reading. Like they're just not going to do it. And so what I love to do is give everybody a chance. Uh, and it doesn't mean they won't be successful. It just means they're, they're probably not going to be as successful as they could be here. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we don't take a real hard line on that. We know there's always going to be programs of participation and non-participation. But for the most part, I'm looking for people with a growth mindset. And I think that's just in life. I like hanging out with people uh, with a growth mindset. Yeah. I mean, you're the sum total of the five people you spend the most time with. And, you know, they're either going to drag you down, you're going to stay the same, or you're going to get uplifted. Um, it's, it's, it's something I see all the time. And, you know, if I'm the smartest guy in the room, that that's a problem. Um, and typically that's... <laughs> You know, sometimes, not that I find that often, I, I really try to surround myself with people who could feed into me, um, but there was a really good question I just had, and of course it slipped my mind, we were talking about uh, soccer and being uncomfortable and everything, um, oh, that's what I was talking about. Whenever, it, for me, my experience when it comes to reading new books or new authors or even listening to new podcasts, it better grab me, and this is kind of the attention mindset that we have for the social media age that we're in for everything we post it better have value for the other person um and all i get recommendations all the time well you got to listen to so-and-so's podcast and this guy's podcast and i'm biased because i'm from a radio background and you know we were always taught that once you crack that mic you better be saying something of value to the listener otherwise they're going to tune you out um it's amazing to me how many people lose me within the first two minutes of a podcast or even a book. And I think that's probably one of the biggest problems is that you just got to give it a chance because eventually some of those podcasts start growing on me. I mean, I I have that kind of attention span with movies. My wife gets, it drives her nuts. She's like, Oh, you have a two, you have a two to three episode limit. I'm like, well, if it doesn't grab me. Yeah. I got to roll. Yeah. It doesn't, I've got other things to, to put my, my brain damage to and bandwidth. So, I mean, maybe that's part of the issue where, because I know when I'm handed a book, I'm like, okay, I gotta, I gotta make time to sit down and read this at some point. <laughs> yeah, it becomes a stack of shame on the side table sometimes, <laughs> right? They just, they sort of just build up, and you start feeling like, oh, I'm never gonna. But it's like, it's like a, it's like so many things. It's the fr- like uh, I was challenged a few years ago uh, to run one mile as fast mm-hmm. as I could, uh, and trained for it, and got ready for it, um, and and did a lot of things there. The, and and I remember. Um, someone telling me, hey, the, the hardest part about running that mile as fast as you can, the hardest part mm-hmm. is the first step because mm-hmm. you're going to know how much, you know how much pain you're about to go through for the next uh, six to 10 minutes, depending on your speed. But that first step, because once you go, you're rolling. And so the same thing, whether you're getting into a book or getting into something that makes you uncomfortable, it's, you know, just start it. Like one of the, one of my, the, the title of the book, Worth Doing Wrong, comes from me saying, hey, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing wrong. That's, that's, a, that's, I may have stole it from someone, but I, I've been saying it for a long time. Uh, make, get it wrong, make it better, get better at it. Just, just keep moving forward. And that first step is the hardest. Is there a podcast in the future for you, man? I think there's yeah. Some- yeah, I, I, you know, the technology alone is kind of starting to get away from me. I got to get some young people to help me figure it out. Uh, but the, but I do, you know, the book, uh, what I got to figure out is what's next. You know, I put everything I knew into here. So now I got to go learn some new stuff and, you know, you know, get out of my own comfort zone and, and start creating some new material. You know, not necessarily. Uh, Dave Ramsey once famously said that he can do his show in six minutes and he does the same show over and over and yeah. over again. So I mean, oh, people the keep pe- listening. The people that have, that have garnered knowledge from that guy, I was listening to him. I don't mean to age him or myself, but when I first moved to town and when I was driving around selling airtime for, for channel five, I mean, I can still hear his voice in my head, you know, mm-hmm. and, and he, and he basically said, you're here. Everyone called in with the same problem and here's the six pieces of advice mm-hmm. and just kept repeating it. And, and that's the way I think I, I've, I've, ru- I've tried to run my business, right? This mm-hmm. is the culture elements of it. Just keep doing it over and over and over again. Keep saying the same things. Let your people make, don't, don't stop until they're making fun of you until they can, until they can imitate you and laugh about it. Uh, we've even found, as an ad agency, one of the last things you want is your is your uh, the the client you're serving is if your ads work too well, they get too busy, and then they call you and say, "Hey, can you slow down the advertising?" Mm-hmm. Because they aren't building their business and their culture the the way they want to. And so, a lot of the work we do is exporting how to build a great culture, how to build a great workplace to our clients, so that when the ads work, they can build their business. 
And, and so it just keeps on going. It keeps on going. You got to keep repeating yourself, repeating yourself so that people do the right thing. Who are some of the, the continuously, the people who continuously feed into your life? Either you know them or you don't know. Who are some of the people you keep going back to? Uh, I, Vern Harnish is a great thought leader who, who pulls people together twice a year for the big conferences they do that constantly is representing new uh, uh, books and new thoughts and new ways to think about the world and, and, and of, of abundance. Uh, Andy Bailey uh, is a local uh, uh, business coach who does who goes who, who is now one of the most sought after coaches uh, in the country. He, uh, he barely stays at home because he's always uh, helping uh, a, a company grow. Yeah. Uh, the um, and, you know there's so many local just heroic people that that I've seen grow and expand their business. Um, I, I, I if I made a list, I'm going to leave a lot of people out, but. Uh, there's so many, and then every new book, right? Is like, oh, where's that guy coming from? I just read Power of Moments uh, by Cheap Heath. You know, what a powerful, powerful concept. Um, the um, a great at work. I, I can't remember the author's name right now. Uh, mm-hmm. Pat Lincioni, who wrote all the fables about how to run your business. I mean, I can go on and on because of the influence of these folks. There's a book that I always preach uh, to people if they have the opportunity to read it. <clears throat> but you ever hear of Roy H. Williams in the advertising world? You must. Yeah, have. I know that name. Wizard yeah. of Ads. Um, yeah. He's written several books, The Wizard of Ads Trilogy, uh, Free the Be- Beagle. He and another guy wrote a book called Pendulum. And it's uh, Roy H. Williams and Michael Drew. And I've had Michael Drew on episode two of this podcast. So harken back to that and listen to that Un- unbelievable concept of a me versus we mindset and culture uh, that's happening right now. And the whole premise is basically in 2023, we're about to live through 1943 all over again with, and it's, and it's, a, and a, they take it back 3000 years <clears throat> and show how that pendulum really does resonate. Wow. And it teaches you how to speak and message to your clients. And, and just in the main, I would suggest that in terms of putting it in there. So give, give me a little more 20, shame. 23, like 43, in what way? Tell me that. With a we, um, essentially, is we're, we're basically on the upswing to the zenith of a we. And a we uh-huh. is a collective mindset. Um, and, I mean, they go, it's so cerebral. And the levels <laughs> of the, you know, the thinking that go into this, if I were to, I'm trying to break it down the best I can. Yeah. But we had a zenith of a me in 1983. So it's a 40-year swing. Wow. Uh, yeah, so, 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 so we're, we're heading back towards we. We're going up towards a me, a we right now, which means the attitude, this is where we find a lot of witch hunts. Uh, These guys have actually called the last four presidential elections prior to the, um, the primaries based on the messaging of the candidates. Wow because of the culture and where it's headed. Great book. Um, but as we start, the, cult, the next culture or the next generation that comes in starts pushing that pendulum back down because they, they kind of grow tired of uh, the previous generation taking a good thing too far. Mm, yeah, I can see. Yeah, I get you. Yeah, I'm with you. That's very cool. Yeah, when people tell me, well, man, this is, we're getting out of control. And I said, you know what? First off, first and foremost, there's nothing new under the sun. And second most, we're going to, we're going to start heading back down after 2023. And typically on the 10 years on either side of that zenith, you'll see uh, the tenets that have happened in 1943, which hunts uh, generally, you know, bad stuff. I mean, but it, both sides are kind of a beautiful in and of, of themselves. Uh, very interesting book. And I, wow. I, su- I suggest put it in your stack of shame. Stack of shame. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's a uh, lot. Yeah. Yeah. But basically um, wrapping up, what is the, uh, what makes you most satisfied about what you do? Oh, most satisfied. Well, I think um For years, um, uh, it has been uh, wake up, um, make the donuts, uh, do all the other stuff you have to do in life, go to bed, wake up, make the donuts, do all this stuff. And it becomes a sort of repetitive cycle. And so what, what, what all that work has done is, is for me is I've created a little freedom, a little space for freedom in my life where I'm not doing the same thing over and over. Um, I, I'm, I'm sort of branching out in some new areas. And so right now I'm enjoying um, a, a little more physical activity, a little more freedom to absorb some information, uh, a little less responsibility at the moment, but we always tend to, 
you know, fill our bucket with which, with which we can carry. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and what I was in a conversation the other day is, is seeing all my, seeing all the things we've taken time to build and where they're going from here. Like they're all going to be more successful than, than they were with me. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm so excited about that. The, the call center is owned by a multi-billion dollar public company and they have the resources to expand that. The ad agency got bought by our largest client and they have a huge, huge vision for where digital is going and where they can take it. Mm-hmm. Uh, even the building that I'm talking to you from right now, uh, where we grew our business, uh, is being taken over and this property is going to be really developed into something much bigger than we have here. And so everything is on a, a, a pattern of growth. My kids are in college. They're, they're learning things that I can never teach them. You know, hopefully gave them a foundation for success. And so seeing them uh, expand, my wife and I are empty nesters now with our 10 year old dog and we're getting to explore things we've never explored before. And so it's just, there's so many things becoming better than they were. And that's where I just start smiling. Right. Yeah. Because it's just, it's been fun to watch. Absolutely. Um, when these companies take over what you've built, are you very careful about translating that culture and making sure they bring the torch forward? We, we do the best we can, but every owner needs to have his own you know, special sauce, right? The, the, the chef comes in. If you just copy the same recipe, do you, do you get the dish that's really uniquely yours? And so hopefully they'll take the best of, they'll add some other ingredients and they'll create something even better. And I'm, and I'm absolutely good with that. Right on, man. Where can people look you up and find you and follow you and everything? Uh, WorthDoingWrong.com is the easiest, uh, hopefully easy to remember, but um, you know, I'm, I'm probably the most findable person in, on the entire, in the entire world. My, my mobile phone is plastered everywhere. My email, I'm easy to reach. I block, uh, uh, I only block you if you, if uh, you have to give me a good reason to. But, uh, <laughs> yes. worth, WorthDoingWrong.com is the easiest place. Right on. Arnie, I thank you. It's been way too long for us to reconnect again, but I'm, I'm glad that you uh, gave me the honor of being a guest on the JMVO Weekly Primer. And I hope that a lot of people, if you have any questions for Arnie, definitely hit him up. I'm going to put his handle uh, over on his side of things and you'll be able to look him up and everything and uh, hit him up for questions, hiring for speaking, get his get the book. I'm going to download the book uh, on Audible and listen to it myself. You have the audio book, right? No, I don't. I know. Oh. I know. I know. And I'm, I'm a, look, I'm a huge audio guy, so I don't, but look, Jim, it's, it's big type. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's like, this is a, this is like, look, and the last 20 pages are just pictures. So it, it's, it's going to go by like that. Trust me. I will, I will have to pick that up. I'll have to give it a it. shot. Give it a shot. It'll be the first book I've physically read in a long time. (laughs) And if you're digging this shirt, like this wrong shirt, you can buy those on our website uh, if if you're digging it because it's kind of cool. The books are on our website, also at Amazon.com. And so just, you know, check us out when you have a chance. Yeah, I love the shirts. I think that's, uh, I'm going to go, I'm going to pick that. I'm going to do the book and the shirt here in the next week for sure. Um, but thank you again for being on the podcast. Uh, please subscribe to the podcast, uh, rate and comment down below. You can go to iTunes, Stitcher, uh, Jim McCarthy, voiceovers.com forward slash podcast singular and be able to get your uh, however you want to subscribe to it right then and there. I'll put that all that stuff down there. Thank you for listening. Arnie, thank you for being my guest. We will talk to you next week. Next week.